Now that we know something about gravity uh, and we know something about circular motion, the next step pretty clearly is to put those together, gravity and circular motion. We're talking about orbit here. So if we consider the orbit of some smaller mass, say a satellite or a spaceship or uh, maybe a moon around a larger mass, maybe a planet, maybe a star, uh, maybe a black hole, um, whatever the, the relationship is there, we need to have a smaller mass over here and a larger mass over here. Uh, the things that are going to be important here are the things that affect the amount of gravity in this situation. So that'd be the masses of the two objects and the distance between them and the gravitational constant. Uh, and then the things that uh, affect circular motion will be important here as well, which is the mass of the object that's doing the orbiting, the overall force toward the center of the circle, the centripetal force, uh, and let's see the speed around that circle, and again the radius or the distance uh, to the center of that orbit. So if we look at this problem in terms of, uh, of circular motion, we know that the net force times, uh, sorry, the net force in the centripetal direction has to be equal to m v t squared over r, where m is the mass of this little uh, object or smaller object, probably it could still be very large, um, as it uh, the, that's going around the circle. Uh, now we also know that the force toward the center of the circle that's causing this is the force due to gravity is going to be equal to mvt squared over r. And if we want a value for the force of gravity, we'd have to take the gravitational constant times the little mass times the big mass, big M, divided by the distance between them squared. And we set that equal to little m vt squared over r. So in this equation then we see that uh, that the little m is going to cancel. We can divide both sides by a little m to make that go away. Uh, and then we'll have, uh, let's see, this r squared on the left side. We have an uh, 1 over r squared on the left, 1 over r on the right. Let's get all the r's over to the same side. So we'll have just g times big M is equal to, let's see, r squared divided by r. That'll just be r times vt squared. And uh, then I want to get, uh, say, vt all by itself. We'll figure out how fast this object is orbiting. So then vt, if I do a little algebra, vt is going to be equal to the square root of g times big M over r. Now one thing that, uh, that you ought to notice with this is that little m is gone from the equation. The mass of that smaller object doesn't matter at all. It has an impact on how large the force is uh, toward the center of the circle, but it also has an impact on how much force it takes to move this thing around in a circle. And those two impacts, they cancel each other out. Uh, so the only thing that matters in terms of mass here is the mass of the large central object. We can forget about the little object. So all satellites um, that are orbiting in uh, around the, the Earth, uh, since G and M, big M, are going to be the same for those. All of them that are orbiting at the same altitude are also orbiting at the same speed, regardless of how, uh, how big or small that little satellite is, or that very big satellite is for that matter. Uh, if we were to take something like a satellite TV dish um, and place that at the same location as the moon, which would be a lousy place for it because it wouldn't be in geosynchronous uh, orbit, and so it wouldn't work. But if we you know, messed up on our calculations and we put one in orbit at the same distance as the moon, then the moon and that satellite would orbit at the same speed. Now let's, let's go on a little bit further. Uh, maybe we're interested in how much time it takes to go around uh, one time, to orbit one time, the orbital period, we would call that. So how much time does it take to go around this circle one time? Well, we know the speed at which it's going around that circle, and we can figure out how big this circle is, what the circumference of that circle is. It's just 2 times pi times the radius. So if we want to know the period, the orbital period, block that off, that's going to be equal to the distance, 2 pi r, 
divided by the speed, which is square root of gm over r. And so our period then is going to be equal to 2 pi times, let's see, we've got an r up top here, divided by an r in the denominator of a fraction, but that's square rooted. So this is going to give us a value of r cubed over gm, all square rooted. So now that we've got an equation for the, uh, the period and for the speed, the orbital speed, um, there's one more thing that we can do with this, and that's to rederive Kepler's third law. Now, Kepler's third law says that uh, if we're looking at objects that are orbiting some common central object, then we can easily predict uh, the relationship between the orbital period and the orbital radius for those objects. So that comes from the, the period equation. So I'll just move this over and do a little more work with this. Uh, if we square root, or sorry, if we square both sides of this, we get t squared is equal to 4 pi squared times r cubed over gm, or t squared is equal to 4 pi squared over gm times r cubed. Uh, or we could say that t squared is proportional to r cubed. And this is Kepler's third law of planetary motion. It says that uh, the, the square of the period of an object that's in orbit around some common central object is uh, directly proportional to the cube of, they call it the semi-major axis, but the, the cube of the, the radius um, to that object. So Kepler's third law right here, we've got the expression for the uh, tangential velocity or the orbital velocity uh, and one for the orbital period. So any of these equations then uh, you might be asked to use on the test or you might be asked to derive them as I've just done.